Hey there, welcome to our AP Legal Zone podcast brought to you by AP Lawyers. We are your top fix for all weekly law updates, including family, immigration, wills, and estates law. Just a friendly reminder we are not your lawyers, and everything contained in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to be construed as legal advice. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you can stay connected with any updates and get notified about our new episodes. Hi everyone, my name is Shreed Abdi and I'm joined with Angela Princewill and today we're going to be talking about divorce and all things divorce. Yes, so it's interesting because we have had so many podcasts where we've talked about all sorts of issues surrounding separation and we had never got to the big one, divorce. And frankly, as a lawyer, um, I, I feel as like... As a divorce the, lawyer. <laughs> uh, yeah, as a divorce lawyer, I feel that the divorces are the easy, almost like the simplest part of what we do. Yes. Um, because, I mean, I guess because of the grounds, right? You, anyone can, you know, a court would grant you your divorce if there's been a breakdown in the relationship. That's all they want. I, I, Interestingly enough, I think the first, when I'm first consulted, um, it's usually let's get a divorce and then I want spousal support, child support, I want to deal with, and I say, listen, what we need to do is deal with every other issue because the divorce is a very seamless process if all the other issues are settled, unless there's, you know, no issue of contention, honestly. Yes. But it's usually the last thing that we look at because it's, unless there's, you know, nothing else but a divorce. Yes. But yeah. I, I, I recognize, I've come to recognize that from an emotional perspective they that the divorce, the divorce means, it means a lot. Yeah. Um, it, it, it was just many years ago, I, I had a, a matter and I, I really focused on getting my client the best support uh, he could possibly, like as little as he could possibly pay for the shortest duration of time. And, and I, you know, fought for his right to see the child. And I did all these things. And when it got, and then once that was done, we were very happy and we were supposed to follow up to do the divorce. But I think we waited a couple of weeks or so. And I did not realize the emotional significance that just being divorced meant. And and ever since, I don't make that mistake anymore. I know that, you know what, the same gusto that we use in pursuing, you know, all these other claims like your parenting and the passion we put into making sure that you get the monies that you deserve. We put that same passion now into getting you your divorce because we understand that from an emotional perspective, you just want to move on. You just want that paper. You want that divorce order. Um, yes. Sometimes we'll go through, you know, when you can actually apply for a divorce. But ultimately, I, I understand it from an emotional yeah. perspective. And we do look at the circumstances. If there's things that could delay your divorce, we want to deal with those first. But yes. from an emotional perspective, we understand. And even if you're trying to get remarried and would want a divorce, like we understand the urgency there too. Yeah. So sometimes when we start the matter... Um, so let's say we were going to court, for example. So we're now at that step of litigation and we would ask for the divorce and we ask for support and we ask, and even the courts don't even talk about your divorce. You would never go for a case conference in front of a judge to talk about your divorce. It's almost like a non-conversation. Yeah, it's not, it's a non-conversation until the cholerary issues are at least dealt, dealt with. with. Now, if you need to get the divorce and we have had clients that need to get it just for emotional reasons. We will we will do our best to make sure that we sever the divorce from the other issues, which essentially means because the courts as a whole don't want to grant that divorce until other issues are dealt with. Yeah. So now we have to apply to the court asking for them to separate the divorce from these other issues and grant you the divorce. And to do that, we need to show that it would not prejudice the other side. And honestly, some things that could prejudice the other side might be their ability to rely on your health benefits, for example. Yep. So that's why sometimes you may see that we're not pushing for your divorce because if you do it, if you don't go about it the right way, you may find yourself paying more. So a simple example is if you have spousal support obligations and your spouse is also relying on your health benefits. If you push ahead and get that divorce and they want and they need, you know, they have medications they rely on and things like that, they now have grounds to ask for the higher end of spousal support to account for them not having your benefits anymore. But if we're kind of silent on things and then everything's settled, a support amount has been have been set, 
then no one's really going to come back on that when you end up going to get your divorce. So there's also strategic reasons why we do certain things, but doesn't minimize the fact that we know you need to get your divorce. So if you want to get a divorce, what does the court consider as a breakdown of a relationship? Well, the easiest is if you've been living separate and apart for one year and you know, at the time you commence the proceedings. Pretty but much. just so you know, separate and apart doesn't mean you need to physically be apart. You could still live in the same home. I think that's the common um, misconception there. Mm -hmm. You could still live in the same property and still be considered separate and apart. Yeah, so the other two um, on common grounds are um, if, if your spouse committed adultery and if you have a spouse that's been physically or mentally cruel to you. So, um, you know, if, if you have, if you're going on grounds of adultery or, or cruelty, in those cases, you don't have to wait for the one year and um, you, you can, can proceed. just proceed with getting a divorce right away. The challenge I have with those two grounds is that our justice system is so slow that you may not get your divorce as quickly as you think. <laughs> Honestly, I think Angela would agree with me in that just wait the year. Just wait the year. And we say this because it might actually take you a year mm -hmm. and you're required to do more because now in these cases of emotional cruelty and adultery, you have to prove these claims. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to prove that you've been separate. I mean, well, unless the other party is that it. But denying. like that's really not a concern we normally have. So honestly, in, in, in that case, like to get to a conference, especially if the other side's disputing, you know, the adultery claim or the emotional mm -hmm. cruelty. Could you, could you imagine even pr pr trying to prove that? Like to and me, the, it's emotionally yeah. devastating to, to you, don't you think? Like that's how I feel. I feel I would be emotionally devastated having to prove. Having, you know, but to be honest, I've, I've spoken to people and they want that justification. They want that on the court pleadings. But I have to leverage that with the cost of what they really want, which is a divorce. Yeah. So honestly, and and then in, in reality, it's it, they're going to make it complicated if they don't agree with you. Not to say that you know you don't have proof, but I want to I want to preface this by saying, even if the other side did um, commit adultery or there was a situation of emotional cruelty, that doesn't change their entitlement to any of their family law claims. And this is yes. something I get. I'm sure you get all the time. Is well, he cheated on me, and or she cheated on me. So you know, so she's not getting anything. I promise you, we're in a no fault jurisdiction in Ontario. So whatever the reason for your separation, the court doesn't care. Yes, the court doesn't care unless you're proving adultery or emotional cruelty on the grounds of getting a divorce earlier than a year. That's the only time in which they would care, but that doesn't change that the person's entitled to a property division, they're entitled mm -hmm. to support, any any other claim, it doesn't have any effect on them. Yeah, and I think it's it's mostly TV, right? You've seen, we've all seen TV shows or things where it's almost like the, the message is, if you committed adultery, then you, don't, you don't get, get no you don't spousal get support. And or, I think maybe yeah. back in the day, or maybe in the States, it was that way, but not under our Divorce Act, not in Canada. Not in Ontario. We have, yeah. we have a no-fault Divorce Act in, um, in Canada, and that's, you know, it's just the way it is. Like, the fact that they committed adultery, as Shireen said, yes, you get your thing in less than a year, you're divorced. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, exactly. I should say that. That's a very big maybe if you, you know, just file for your divorce, maybe right after the day, right after you find out about the adultery. Otherwise, it does nothing for you. And it's, it's, it hurts me to see that because a lot of times, so many times, clients would have done their investigation. They yes. have the text messages for me. Some of them have even gone as far, you know, they've asked friends. Some have even gone as far as hiring private investigators. Yep. And I remember one time a client was like, so this was all for nothing. And it was heartbreaking. Like, I, I know how hard it must have been. I imagine looking at the private investigator's pictures on, and all of that. Like, I got her. I actually... And now it doesn't matter. Like, she cheated. And it's yeah. even as, as a person that has to equalize your pensions, if you're the main breadwinner, for example, so your, so let's say, you know, your spouse cheated on you, your partner has cheated on you. Not only do they get to break up the family because you're not willing to condone their adultery, they now get maybe half of your income and spousal support. They may become the primary care parent of your children. So you lose seeing your children daily. Then they also get, you know, half your property. It's it's just a no win all around. So if you're going to spend money retaining us to fight and prove this adultery, 
we think it's just another nail in the coffin that we just don't want to hit. Yeah, and sometimes it's more emotionally dragging to have to go through that process. And honestly, at this current timeline with the with the court's backlog and COVID, you're definitely not going to get mm-hmm. a divorce faster <laughs> than, yeah, especially if they're disputing it. I, it's very unlikely, in my opinion, that you're going, and depending on the court, of course, but... It's, unlikely. it's very yes. unlikely. So our advice to you is... Is don't gather the evidence of the cheating. And while it may be useful for you and, you know, confronting your partner, but for our purposes, we don't need to see three, four years of, you know, evidence. And I, I could tell you, like, I had, unfortunately, a consul come to me and he had a USB of every single movement that his spouse had done for the last... Wow three or four years and so he had known this for three or four years and was gathering all of this evidence thinking that this would in some way be sufficient for honestly I don't even know but yeah I felt so horrible and I, I just I, I would hate to see anyone you know use that emotional time and exactly energy for nothing. And, and, and really and, and from a legal context nothing if it brings you satisfaction and you have, you know, to confront your partner, 100% do it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people don't, some people would say, well, she hasn't told me why we're ending, she's ending the marriage. I don't know why. I've done everything and I don't, I, you know. We what? don't have to cite reasons, Yeah, she doesn't just, to, no. just to, you reconcile, like he, She doesn't want, yeah. she's lived separate and apart from you for a year or he's lived separate and apart from you for a year. Just to break down as they are, They're going to, they're going to get the divorce and, you know, you can either keep it simple or just drag it on but either way it's 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 going to happen so the most common ground as you can tell is it's waiting a year is waiting a year if you're being separate and apart for that um so um there's different processes um for getting your divorce but before that um Shireen, did you want to talk about the jurisdiction um, yes um okay. jurisdiction so oftentimes you know people will say well you know we've been living here but we were married in pakistan So I don't have to get divorced here. I'm going to go get divorced in Pakistan. Unfortunately, no. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. If you're both living there, fine. But you're now here. um, And Canada has the ability to exercise jurisdiction. They have the ability to exercise jurisdiction if only one of you applies for divorce and has been living here for a year. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter where you were married. Ontario can enforce jurisdiction if they need to. And not just in terms of a divorce, in terms of any property claims that you may have so that's a common misconception especially when with foreign marriages and people who have now immigrated here Mm -hmm. and i want to sound a note of caution because sometimes spouses do this deliberately okay knowing that if you okay so here's the thing if you get a divorce overseas you may be people do that to try to avoid the court the, the issues of spousal support under the divorce act Okay, so once you've gotten a divorce, the Divorce Act no longer applies to you. And so the courts cannot, and if for whatever reason, it's more beneficial to you to bring your claim under the Divorce Act versus the Family Law Act for whatever reason, um, that person getting that divorce overseas has just automatically taken jurisdiction away from the court by doing that. So there's there's been times where, you know, I think I've tried to remember a case a while ago and where that had happened and that this was... Um, a divorce that was granted in China, and unfortunately, because the divorce has been had been granted, the courts and in this case, they both agreed the court had um, didn't have jurisdiction under the Divorce Act to grant the spousal support claim that the other party had brought, and it was just an unfortunate situation for them, right? And even in some cases as well, even when you have this um, overseas like divorces and stuff, it might be it's. It's sometimes one person also going overseas and and getting that divorce. If you both agree, that might be fine because I guess some if in your country or in the country you yeah, in some my, countries in some only countries you're allowed one person to. or a male can only ask for a divorce and nothing happens. No, like, I'm even wondering from a residency perspective. Like maybe you don't need to be a resident so long as you got married there. Maybe I you're think allowed. Maybe you're to. like a national. Yeah, like you're you're okay. just you have citizenship in that country in general. I think you That's should be true. able to apply. Again, I'm not speaking from it from an immigration perspective, but people have gotten foreign divorces from the place of their origin, like their country of origin. And then come back to Canada and said, well, we're divorced, too bad. Unfortunately, there are times where the court can, you know, 
take it back and say, well, you know what? Yep. You just went there on a vacation to get a divorce and then came back here. You mm-hmm. live here and you did it to I avoid. Think, I think what the courts look at is sort of how there's public policy considerations and different things. A major one is is notice, right? And which is a very important part of our justice system. Like if you if a case is going to be brought against you, you need to know the case you have to be. You de- like not, our justice system is premised on that. So you can't just go get a divorce, not inform the person, and now they're divorced. So if there is no notice given to the other party and you have a divorce guaranteed, your divorce order is not valid. It's not going to be accepted in Ontario and you just wasted time doing that so um so so if you're the spouse in that scenario know that there is recourse exactly so in terms of divorce processes we have the simple and the joint um divorce process so when would you choose one or the other so a simple divorce i mean honestly if you're i mean there's different reasons to do different things and it may just be you guys are a simple divorce is essentially where you would just serve um the other party they have and 30 all days. You're asking for is divorce, all you're asking for is divorce, else. maybe costs, fine, <laughs> if yes. they disagree. But you're not asking for support, you're not asking for parenting, nothing it's, else. Yeah, so basically your only actual claim is for a divorce, and you would serve the other side. Um, they have 30 days to respond. If they contest the divorce, then that whole thing starts in a very interesting element. But let's just keep it simple. They have 30 days to respond. If they don't respond, you do the second part of the divorce, which is a simple um, Form 36 affidavit. And then you would wait for the court to give you your divorce. And then in a joint process, you're actually both completing the joint application for a divorce. You're both completing the same paperwork and it all gets submitted to the court. And then if all is good, you get your divorce order. And then from a divorce order, you guys can apply for a certificate of divorce, which can be done 31 days after the date of your divorce order. And that's when your divorce actually takes effect. Yeah. So, so after if you have you get... a problem with your divorce, exactly. which I actually had a client have a problem within. So he received like, let's just say it's June. Well, what even <laughs> June 1st and your divorce order takes effect June 30. June 30th, let's just say. Or it, July, July 1st. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you dispute the divorce. Maybe you even changed your mind or you reconciled because that's happened as well. And you can actually stop the process before that 31 days takes effect. But let's just say you, you're not stopping the process. You're content. You would apply for a certificate of divorce. And this is mainly done where you plan to remarry and you may need it for immigration purposes as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's it for, for divorces. I can't think of anything else to share with you um, on that mat- matter. If you're, you know, if it's been over a year and... Just um, wait the year, just wait the year. <laughs> <laughs> if it's over a year, the courts, if you've not, if you've lived separate and apart, the courts are not going to find out where, who is at fault. They will grant you the divorce. And, and yeah, so that's it for today. And until next time, bye for now. Thank you, bye. Thanks for listening and joining us in the AP Legal Zone. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find more episodes by searching AP Legal Zone on anywhere you watch podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast today so you can stay connected with any updates and get notified about any new episodes.